Yeah. Pardon me. Sorry about that. Good. No, 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 no. That's very good. Very good. Okay. From the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, I'm Brad Smith. Now today we have a very special discussion coming your way about the future of energy, climate change, and the role of the Energy Transitions Commission. And specifically, we are joined by Lord Adair, Adair Turner, who is the chairman for the Energy Transitions Commission. Great to have you here today. Great to be here. Absolutely. Let's dive right in because we need to know for the Facebook Live audience, what is the, what Energy, is the Trans Energy Transitions Transition. Commission? Okay. <laughs> the Energy Transitions Commission is a combination of companies and uh, uh, environmental NGOs with a very diverse uh, membership. Environmental NGOs well respected like Rocky Mountain Institute, mm -hmm. World Resources Institute, but companies like Shell and BHP Billiton, okay. uh, Indian companies like Tata, French companies like uh, Saint-Gobain. We cover the whole spread of people who are either involved in the sort of global policy issues relating to the climate, but also okay. people who are making money both out of existing fossil fuels mm -hmm. and out of new renewable energies. And this group of people are all combined by the belief that we face two big challenges yep. in the world. We have got to deliver more energy across the world on average to drive economic growth, to enable the rest of people to achieve the same standard of living which we already enjoy in sure. the US or Europe. A place like India at the moment uses a tenth as much energy per person as the US does. Wow. They're going to have more energy needs. But we've got to do that in a way that doesn't fry the, uh, fry the planet. Right. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, global warming does not exceed what we call two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we've got to meet these energy needs with much less carbon emissions. Now, we're very confident that it can be done. And as I say, I think the argument that it's com we're confident that it can be done should be taken seriously mm -hmm. if it's coming from Shell, and BHP Billiton, a coal company, right. and people who are in renewable energy, wind and solar, and environmental NGOs who care about the climate. There's a credibility, I hope, from the fact that there's such a diverse group of people Absolutely. willing to sign up to what we've said. So how do we then go about facilitating that energy transition? Because as you mentioned, you know, yep. there's a lot of output that we're going to be generating, but how do we make sure that climate change stays low okay. so that we are in a safe environment? Okay. The, the bit which is sort of easy, I mean, it's not, it's, it, it requires a hell of a lot of investment, mm -hmm. but it's easy in the sense that we know the answer. Right. We now know that renewable renewable energy, uh, wind and solar, is on a relentless downward cost path and that it's going to end up cheaper than fossil fuels. And it's essentially, if you stick with fossil fuels, you're going to be giving up the opportunity of having uh, even cheaper energy. And actually, the crucial thing that we've done in our report is to answer the question, but what happens when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Sure. I mean, everybody now knows that the raw cost of actually delivering kilowatt hours of electricity from solar has become incredibly low. There are bids to provide it at less than three cents per kilowatt hour. But what do you do about this intermittency problem? We've done an analysis that shows that that's completely soluble, that with the collapsing cost of batteries, and that's going to go on just down and down and down, mm -hmm. and with the ability to use gas turbines just a little bit of the year when you need them, when your batteries can't be a sufficient storage capacity, Right. You can run a system, you will be able within 15 years to run a system uh, which is more than 90% based on wind and solar 
and you will be able to provide the backup and the storage for that on a cost-effective basis. And this is something which has really only emerged in the last three years with mm -hmm. the technological and cost breakthroughs which are being made, but it's transformational because it means we can, at least everything in energy which relies on electricity, right. we can decarbonize that. And then we can take that clean electricity and we can apply it to a wider set of economic functions. We can electrify autos. We may even, and this is, re is really surprising to me, five years ago I thought this was completely impossible, we may even have have a role for electricity in short haul aviation, which sure. is really surprising. Now, the other point to make, however, is that although we can achieve a lot by clean electrification, take the carbon out of electricity, mm. do more things with electricity, it's not sufficient because then you get down to other areas of the economy like making steel, making cement, right. where you can't electrify that. You need an intense heat. You need 2,000 degrees of heat. That's difficult wow. to do with electricity. And that, the way forward, is less clear, but there's a set of interesting technologies called carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, bioenergy. But we need to make sure we get the same progress on those technologies mm -hmm. as we've been achieving to a dramatic extent on renewable electricity. So uh, you mentioned a moment ago that the goal is to make sure that the costs remain low for the end users as well. Yep. What's, what is then the involvement for the companies? What's the benefit for some of the companies that are getting involved early on uh, to make sure that the costs are low? Because I imagine that they would want to make sure that there's still significant energy sector strength at the end of the day. Well, look, wh whenever you have a new technology, mm -hmm. um, uh, that new technology tries to compete with the existing technology by being lower cost. I mean, that's what capitalism is about. That's yeah. what the market economy is about. That's what NASDAQ's uh, all about. New technologies which enable us to deliver things to the customer at a lower cost. Yep. And so the new guys who are in uh, solar and wind, what they're simply looking at is their costs. Okay. And as long as when they make a bid and say, I'll deliver electricity at three cents a kilowatt hour or even less than that in some locations, as long as they've worked out you know, that that's going to make a profit for them. Right. Um, they don't care about the fact that that's a lower price than before. Sure. And indeed, that's, that's what we should be achieving uh, in capitalism, is continually lower prices because we're using better and better technologies. Uh, absolutely. So uh, today, ETC launched a new report, Better Energy, Greater Prosperity, uh, that offers some new insight into the, yep. some of the achievable goals we've been discussing yep. here this morning. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that new report. Okay, well, that new report basically says, Here's the challenge we've got to meet on the climate side. Mm -hmm. We, at present, in the energy system worldwide, we've put out about 36 billion tons per year of CO2. Wow. We've got to get that down to about 20 billion tons a year by 2040. Which, which uh, region is producing the most right now? Uh, well, the, per right. capita, mm -hmm. the U.S. produces US. the most okay. by, by a long lot. I mean, it Yikes. produces twice as much per capita as Europe does. Okay. It still produces twice as much or over twice as much as China does. Now, China is actually now a bigger emitter in absolute CO2, but that's because mm -hmm. they have a population which is about three and a half to four times that of the U.S., so sure. they're bound to. In per capita terms, it's Australia and U.S. Are right at the top, and then some poor African countries and uh, places like India uh, at the bottom, essentially because they use very little in energy. Right. So overall, though, the challenge is how do we reduce these, the, these emissions? What we're saying is we've got to do four things. Mm -hmm. We've got to take the carbon out of electricity, okay. and we know how to do that. Yep. We've got to work out how to take the carbon out of steel production and uh, you know, cement production. Sure. And although we know that that is technically possible, mm -hmm. there's a lot more work to work out how to do that really cost effectively and what the best way is. So the way forward is a little less clear on that. That's where we need more work on what to do. We've got to improve energy productivity. We've got to drive just more efficient refrigerators, better insulated houses. I mean, we have huge opportunities to give end consumers, you know, the thing that they care about, you know, a warm house, a lit house, mm -hmm. a car that goes from A to B, but use much less energy because it's more uh, energy efficient. And then we've got to do what we call optimize fossil fuel within the constraints. You've got to limit the total amount of fossil fuels, but within the limited fossil fuels, we need to use fossil fuels where it's least easy to substitute it. And the easiest thing to substitute, actually, mm -hmm. is coal power because we can, we can replace coal-based electricity with renewables. It's going to take us longer to replace 
oil mm. with electric cars. That'll take a bit longer. And it's going to take us a bit longer still to find out alternatives to gas as, for instance, a chemical feedstock. So sure. what's going to happen, or what needs to happen across the world, and what is economically sensible to happen, is big reductions in the use of coal, some reductions in the use of oil. Uh, for at least 20 years or so, there won't be reductions in the use of gas, but that will eventually come down as well. Absolutely. So when we think about some of the connections that need to be made in terms of the big corporations that are involved within this major transition, is there a conversation taking place on the technology side on, you know, with the companies that may not directly be involved oh, yeah. with some of the energy? Uh, well, I, I, I think there's a, there are a lot of companies uh, involved in our Energy Transition Commission okay. and there are many other... From the tech sector. The, the right, uh, oh, the tech, now I tell you what's really important on the, uh, uh, on the tech side. There's, a whole series of issues to do uh, with the use of technology mm -hmm. to uh, enable a better use of electricity. Sure. At the moment, you go home, and the moment you want to use a piece of electricity, uh, you, you switch it on. You don't think about the time of day, right. right? But actually, that electricity is much more valuable at the time when everybody else is trying to use it than when, you know, the middle of the night, where right. there's basically surplus electricity. Now, in future, you may have an electric car. If you simply drive it home and switch it on, and it powers up between 7 in the evening and 10 in the evening while everybody else is doing it, yep. that's going to drive up the cost of electricity. If we can put a bit of <coughs> software into your house, a smart meter, a central control system, which is saying, well, everybody else is charging up at the moment. Why don't I send a signal to you to say, don't charge up at the moment, charge up between 2 and 5 in the morning. I mean, the software will do it for you. Yep. And if you do that, I'll make sure it's a really low cost. But of course, that's not even a signal that it has to tell you. It'll just do that automatically. So the issues of using information and communication technology for a much more smart management of electricity, including the twist, that what we may do is you may put in a program saying, I'm, I'm unlikely to use my car for the next three days. Mm -hmm. And the system will say, OK, I will use your car as a storage device for electricity. I'll put some electricity into it, and then I'll take electricity out. So this whole area of smart demand management right. in a, a, a electricity uh, is a huge area of opportunity where tech companies clearly have a very major uh, role to play. And so, and so this kind of brings us back to, I know there was a conversation taking place uh, early, uh, I think around 2010, 2011, around cap and trade, and there were a yep. lot of companies that we're getting involved with, how do we create a model whereby companies can have a solid cap and trade infrastructure? Um, are we seeing that now come down to the personal level with our, our own usage? Well, we, we're not. I mean, the, the fact is that cap and trade has not been as a big a success as we, we thought it would be. Okay. I, I, you know, most sort of pure free market economists uh, 10 years ago said the most important thing is to have a cap and trade system. Sure. There'll be a price that'll send uh, price signals. And the flagship version of a cap and trade was the European emission trading system. Okay. Now, unfortunately, what happened was then a whole load of political lobbying where a whole load of heavy industry said, oh, yeah, but I've got to be given uh, free permits and then the Polish coal industry said, well, there's got to be permits for me, et cetera. We ended up with so many permits in the system that the price was so low sure. that it didn't make a difference. Yeah. So if you're going to have a cap and trade system, you've got to be serious about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have a total amount of a, uh, uh, permits in the system, which actually achieve what you're trying to achieve, which is a price which is high enough to send the signals to people, you know, search out the opportunities for new energies or for mm -hmm. energy efficiency improvements. Now, I think we're going to return to cap and trade. I think it's received a setback, but, uh, as I say, by the fact that the European emission trading system was really undermined by political lobbying. And around Europe, some company, countries like the UK really sort of gave up on that and said, no, we're just going to impose a carbon tax. Sure. So the government decides what the price is and slowly increases it over time. And there is quite a lot of support for that around the world. And actually, quite a lot of industry quite likes that, yeah. because then at least they know in advance what the price is going to be, rather than the price emerging from a market uh, in an uncertain basis. So you can progress by carbon taxes or by ca cap and trade. Both have a role to play, and we'll see which, uh, which develop over time. Very quick, 15 seconds before we wrap. Um, how can many young investors who might be watching here today get involved in the energy transition that's taking place? Look at opportunities in solar. Look at opportunities in wind. Look at opportunities in batteries. Keep your eye out for the next generation battery beyond lithium iron. You know, if we had really still better batteries, even better batteries than Tesla's developing, 
then we can transform the world. I'm absolutely sure that they're going to be technologically developed at some stage, but once somebody works out how to do it, they're sitting on a gold mine plus, plus, plus. Absolutely. Thanks for being here today and discussing right. the future of energy and uh, some of the transition that's taking place. Great to have you here, uh, Lord Adair. And thank you all for watching live on Facebook. Stay tuned for more coming from the NASDAQ market site throughout the rest of the day. That's Lord Adair Turner, chairman of the Energy Trans Transitions Commission. Thanks for thank being you. here. Thank you. Okay. Good. Easy enough? Good. <laughs> Very good. Sweet. Thank you.